Yeah, good morning, everybody. My uh, name is Dr. Al Saidi. I'm a psychiatrist. Uh, I really um, appreciate everybody who uh, attended this conference. This is the first annual CBBF annual medical conference. Uh, we hope that we would be able to do it annually. Thank you all for coming. And I will present today managing depression in general practice. Uh, my presentation will be about 30 minutes. And after this, we'll give time for questions and answers. Again, thank you all for uh, attending. These are my credentials in a quick. I do not have any disclosures in the last two years. I would like to um, discuss first the diagnostic criteria of depression. Uh, I know that most of us are aware of it, but just to recap, um, depression needs two weeks of symptoms. It is so important in mental health to remember the duration criterion. How long does a medication need to stay before we can diagnose it? In major depressive episode is two weeks of symptoms. And these symptoms, one of it at least should be feeling sad or loss of interest. There are nine important symptoms and to diagnose depression, we need at least five of these. Sadness, low energy, appetite change, guilt or worthlessness, psychomotor agitation or retardation, interest loss, concentration loss, sleep changes and suicidal thoughts. Uh, we use the mnemonic called SIG-E caps to remember it. Before we can diagnose depression, these symptoms should be impairing, impairing in social, in academic and in work situations. And we have to exclude that these symptoms are caused by substances of abuse or any medical condition. One of the most important things in depression is to ask yourself this question. Is this is a bipolar disorder? And this the episode is depression outside of bipolar or not? So just give an idea about what's a manic episode quickly. A manic episode is euphoria or irritability has to be for one week. So remember, one week for manic episode. We need three out of these seven. Grandiosity, distractibility, depressed sleep, impulsivity, talkativeness, and racing thoughts. Also, some people might have goal-directed activity. So we need three. One week, impairment social academic functions and not due to a substance or medical condition. One of the most common, I would say, believe me, common medical uh, conditions um, that causes mania are the thyroid crisis. One of the most common medications is actually uh, corticosteroids. A hypomanic episode is an episode that looks like, but it is less. So you have four days and there is impairment in the social functioning. And again, not due to a substance or a medical condition. So before we go further, let me explain a few points in depression. Number one, we have five out of these nine symptoms. Let us go back and look to these symptoms. Sadness, interest loss, energy loss, concentration loss, appetite change, sleep changes, suicidal thoughts, psychomotor agitation. If we look to, to interest loss, energy loss, concentration loss, Appetite changes, sleep changes, I bet you 50% of the book of medicine have these symptoms. So that is why we say one of these symptoms has to be sadness or interest loss. So you ask the patient, how do you feel? And the patient has to say, I feel sad. I'm not happy. I'm miserable. Without this, there is no diagnosis of depression because a lot of medical conditions have energy loss, interest loss, concentration loss, appetite changes, sleep changes, part of uh, these symptoms. That is why it is important to make sure that we are dealing with depression and that there is no medical condition perpetuating it and there are no substances causing it. Once we get this, we need to ask a few questions. The, one of the important questions are, is it grief? Are we bereaving, bereaving the loss of a loved one? Loss can be, can be a loss of a loved one. Loss can be loss of status. Loss can be loss of health. Loss can be a loss of a lot of things, not just somebody is dead. It's important to understand that 
if the patient meets the criteria of depression, we cannot diagnose grief. So grief is a feeling, a mixture of feelings and thoughts and behaviors. Behaviors usually are culturally sanctioned. So what are the behaviors that a reasonable individual in a certain culture would call grief? This is important. So there is a normal grief that occurs with everybody and the typical symptoms of bereavement will be culturally sanctioned according to the cultures. So for instance, back in Egypt where I came from, if if, if a lay man hears voices or, or his father talks to him or comes sit down beside him in the bed, that, that is part of the grief. There are conditions that we call abnormal or complicated grief, when the symptoms are either very intense or prolonged or abnormal. Like for instance, if I meet somebody who's not shaven because his father died next day, that's normal. But after a month, that's not. Or if it is so severe, somebody goes to the graveyard, wants to spend the night with his dead father, that's also abnormal. These symptoms should reside after six months in typical grief. If not, we have to think, are we now dealing with depression or not? The major treatment of grief is supportive therapy. We usually don't give antidepressants for somebody who's grieving. The second important uh, exclusion is, is this is an adjustment disorder. The word adjustment disorder, we used to call it, to call it in the past reactive depression. Is this is a reaction to stress. So is there an emotional or behavioral symptoms in response to this stress? There has to be a stress that occurred within three months before the start of the symptoms. And the symptoms has to be out of proportion to the severity of the stress, and it has to cause impairment. Impairment in school, work, or all the functions of life. The functions of life like being a husband, being a wife, being a neighbor, being a son, and so forth. Adjustment disorder should not meet the criteria for depression or another medical condition. And it should not be an exacerbation of a previous episode of major depression. So if somebody is diagnosed with depression in the past, we have a solid diagnosis of depression, even with stress, if the patients show symptoms, this is merely a relapse to the depression. And we will treat it then by prescribing antidepressants. Whereas in normal adjustment disorder, we may start psychotherapy at the beginning. We need to exclude grief again, and once the stressor is terminated, symptoms usually abate within six months and people are back to normal function. There is a very peculiar type of depression called the dysthymia. This means bad, thymia, bad mood, bad mood most of the time. We call it persistent depressive disorder. A persistent <laughs> depressive disorder, think about it this way. They used to call it in the past a depressive personality disorder. Somebody who's, you will meet always people who are always gloomy, have a pessimistic uh, uh, view of life. Uh, the future is going to be bad. Everybody's bad. I am bad. People are bad. And it is part of their overall thinking. We used to call this dysthymia. But the new nomenclature wanted to be fair to these people because even these people will have time when they feel normal again, when they feel happy with new relationships or with some success. So the definition of persistent depressive disorder now is two years. So two years of symptoms. Within these two years, there were no two months without symptoms. So that's number one. And the major symptoms in persistent depressive disorder is these six ones, and we just need two of them. Sleep changes, hopelessness, concentration loss, low energy, low self-esteem, appetite change. It occurs for two years and it causes impairment. The thing, the, these diseases need to cause impairment, otherwise we will not call it diseases. And also it has not to be caused by substance or medication. One of the most common substances here is cannabis. Cannabis causes something called amotivational syndrome, 
which comes with a picture that can look like persistent depressive disorder. Antidepressants will not work. Cognitive behavior therapy will not work because there are no negative thoughts to correct with cognitive behavior therapy. It is due to the deleterious effect of cannabis on the cannabinoid receptors and other areas of the brain. And it also causes some depletion of the dopaminergic system, causing uh, low self-esteem, low energy, um, and low libido also. What to do if somebody has a persistent depressive disorder? The, the treatment is cognitive behavior therapy. Aaron Beck, who is the founder of cognitive behavior therapy in the 70s, actually brought cognitive behavior therapy to treat dysthymia to start with. That was the first presentation of cognitive behavior therapy, treating dysthymia, correcting the negative thoughts, correcting how we negatively always see the half part of the glass that is not full. And then because cognitive behavior therapy proven to be excellent, it had more adaptation in other settings. So now we use it in almost every, but it, it used to come at the beginning in this time. Remember, concentration loss, low energy, sleep changes, and these things can occur in a lot of medical problems. That's important. One of the uh, medical problems that I would like to mention here is sleep apnea. Sleep apnea causes low, low energy, disturbed uh, sleep, next time, uh, next day fatigue, um, uh, sleepness, uh, impaired functions. So uh, I usually, when I give an antidepressant for somebody like this, and I don't show improvement, send my patients to a sleep consultation. What are the substances that commonly causes depression? Uh, when I say depression, I mean the major depressive disorder, the depression that is due to chemical imbalance. That's what I mean. Major depressive disorder due to chemical imbalance. Alcohol, big time. Stimulants, in particular cocaine. Opioids, corticosteroids, beta blockers, um, contraceptives. One of the common ones is Accutane. I get some referrals from dermatologists to see the patient before they start Accutane and interferon as well. People who get treatment for hepatitis, among other things. Um, if you need to remember a few of them, please remember alcohol and corticosteroids. The medical conditions that are actually very, very commonly present in the chemical imbalance of depression and can cause a picture of depression that is indistinguishable from depression is sleep apnea, anemia, hypothyroidism, vitamin B12 or D. We have enough evidence now to support giving vitamin D to people with depression. Fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia in particular with connective tissue diseases. Now fibromyalgia and connective tissue diseases are problematic in many ways because the patients have chronic pain syndrome. This perpetuates the depression. This also causes uh, uh, low morale and low self-esteem and demoralization. And they further perpetuate the depressive symptoms. Fibromyalgia also is problematic into people with fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia have a little bit of a sensitive reaction to medications. You give them a medication that should help them sleep. It doesn't cause them to sleep. It causes them to have insomnia and so forth. Um, one of the important also uh, medical conditions that causes depression, female sex hormone disruption. Uh, remember that it can happen during menarche at the beginning. It uh, happens uh, in the um, late pregnancy and postpartum, and it happens uh, a lot in the perimenopausal area and time. The circadian rhythm disruption as well, seasonal affective disorder, uh, shift to work, uh, jet lag can cause uh, depressive symptoms. The, the, the important question when we see a patient with depression for the first time, let us say a patient comes for the first time with an, a depressive episode. This is the first depressive episode in their life. How can we tease out if this is a depressive episode out of a major depressive disorder, or is it a depressive episode out of a bipolar disorder, but luckily 
the first episode was depression instead of mania. There are features that will make us suspicious of bipolarity in, in, in a depressive episode. For instance, earlier age of onset. When you have multiple prior uh, depressive episodes occurring in shorter time, a family history of bipolar disorder, depression with psychotic features. Remember the postpartum depression. This is a very typical one. Psychomotor retardation. When the people have psychomotor retardation, they, they, they have all the energy loss. Uh, they, they, they sleep a lot. Uh, usually they, uh, they, their appetite is, is, is voracious. When, when depression has atypical symptoms, when it is due to postpartum depression, when it is around a suicidal attempt. Why? Because the incidence of suicide in, in, in bipolar disorder reaches about 10%, far more than depression. Also, if the uh, uh, episode is related to an induction of an antidepressant, what are the things in a depressive episode that makes us think it is most likely unipolar? Unipolar, I mean major depressive disorder. If there are no family history of bipolar disorder, we don't say if there is family history of depression because still we don't know. But we say here if, if there is no family history of bipolar disorder. If the depression is late onset, if it occurred in longer duration, a depressive episode uh, that has been resistant for six months, um, when, when it causes appetite changes, when we have a lot of somatic complaints, headaches, migraines, muscle aches, um, dizziness, then we think of major depression more than bipolar dis de de depression. So look to this curve. We have here, so pe people have the normal, like the normal mood, and then when they have Depression, they usually dip into depression until they reach the point when they meet the diagnostic criteria. They have five out of nine symptoms for more than two weeks. And believe it or not, even without treatment, people will eventually come back to remission. This is the natural course of major depression. This, and when people go back to baseline, we call this remission. When we have a patient in the clinic, and we start an antidepressant, and we give them rating scales, say PhD Q9 or, or Hamilton rating scale, and we rate the scales and we wait for two weeks and the patients come back, and we rate again and we see 50% reduction, then this is a good response. This is a response that shows us that we need to continue with the same antidepressants. We don't need to change it. We may optimize it up a little bit, maybe, but that shows us that the um, that treatment is working. There are there is some evidence to say that uh, if after a week or something, twenty percent of improvement occurred, that's a good response. We are on the good track. So this is a response. Now, when people reach remission, means people are back one hundred percent. What does that mean? They feel well, and they do well meaning they are back to work, back to school, they are back to their previous, we call this remission. If remission continues for six months or a year, different schools are different. I believe it is 12 months, but some other people might say six months. It is six to 12. Then we call this recovery. Why this is important? Because in recovery, we use what we call maintenance treatment, whereas in remission, we cause continuation. So. This is important also in counting of the episodes. So if somebody relapses during the, the first six months or so, this is a relapse to the index episode. So we are still in the first episode. We are still in the second. But if the symptoms come back after a year, this is a new episode, and we call this recurrence. Why this is important? Because the guidelines will tell you what to do in the first episode, what to do in the second, what to do in the third, what to do in the fourth. So it's important to count correctly what is relapse versus what is recurrence. 
Before we start talking about antidepressants, I want you guys to know that almost all research told us that we have 33% non-responders with every antidepressant. Three, 33 none means they do not respond. So be prepared that one third of your patients will not respond to your antidepressants. Usually these are the one third that we will get as psychiatrists at the end from family doctors. Most family doctors will start to treat people and we want to encourage this. We want to encourage this because there is not enough psychiatrists to see every in, uh, depressed individual. And it's unfair for a depressed individual to wait for six months to see a psychiatrist. I would encourage every family doctor to start treating uh, the patient. And if the patient falls under these people, then definitely a referral to a psychiatrist. Let us talk about antidepressants. Monoaminoxys inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, tricyclic antidepressants are not in use for depression nowadays. So let us not talk about them in length. Let's start with the real group called SSRI, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitor. This is the most safe. It is effective. This is the baseline um, group of medications you will start when you diagnose a major depressive disorder. Why? Number one, they recruit only one monoamine, which is serotonin. So you are not aware of side, sorry, not aware, I'm sorry. You will not be um, uh, afraid of uh, side effects from other things like norepinephrine increasing blood pressure and these things, or dopamine causing mania, hypomania, or causing your patient to have, um, um, you know, um, switching to other polarities. And they are not specific, they are selective, meaning they just excite the, ser the serotonin pump to, pro to pump more of the serotonin into the postsynaptic receptor. And by doing this, the chemical imbalance of poor serotonin, hopefully over two weeks improves and people start to feel well. There are six medications in this group. The fluoxetine that we call Prozac, sertraline that we call Zoloft. In the Middle East, it's also called Lostral. Paroxetine we call Paxil. In the Middle East, I believe they call it Ciroxat. Citalopram, Selexa, uh, Supralex, Escitalopram. In the United States, they call it Lexabro and Fluvoxamine, Leovox. And in other areas, it is also Fluvoxamine. Um, I believe in the Middle East, they call it, uh, I will remember the name now when I stop thinking about it. Um, when, do you, when do you push hard in using SSRIs and serotonin reuptake inhibitors? When people have OCD, OCD is all about serotonin. When you have an OCD patient, you need to to give as much serotonergic agents as you can, but don't shoot too much to serotonin syndrome, but as much serotonin. So SSRIs, remember also we use clomipramine and afranil, which is a tricyclic that is serotonergic there, and the fluvoxamine. So the one that you will choose, if you have OCD, probably this one, fluvoxamine. Some people use Supralex. It's a good one too. This is the most effective, but the problem with this, it has more side effects on the gastrointestinal tract. Why? Gastrointestinal tract has a lot of serotonergic receptors. When people have severe anxiety, like post-traumatic or panic, when people have impulsive symptoms, impulsive symptoms like people with borderline personality disorder, uh, people with addiction, why anorexia? My, well, some, somebody might ask me, uh, you, you give an SSRI to, to, to uh, close the appetite of somebody who's an anorexic? I'm not targeting anorexia here, but there is a lot of OCD in anorexia. A lot of times the obsessive component is food and people are obsessed with food and they, their relationship with food becomes obsessive. 
then these medications will help this part and improve the symptoms. Bulimia has a lot of impulsivity on it. Actually, some people use anti-convulsive agents now with, with bulimia. So going back to this, if you have somebody with OCD, I will use either fluvoxamine or um, Ciprolex. Somebody has panic, post-traumatic, probably go Paxil. This is going to be more strong here. Somebody has a lot of impulsivity, probably goes uh, to Ciprolex or use uh, the Lostral Zolo. If you are treating somebody who's young, people who are 15, 16, 17, 18, this age, I would say stick to fluoxetine and sertraline. These are the two ones that were best studies in the teenage group. And please don't be afraid of the this uh, notion about suicidality. It is very rare. Uh, you educate the patient, you educate the family, you give them a uh, brochure about what to do if they feel suicidal. Mind you that teenage depression causes a lot of suicide also because teenagers are impulsive by nature. After the SSRIs dominated the world between 1988, I would say to about early 90s, uh, a lot of people were switched from the tricyclic antidepressants to the SSRIs and some of them relapsed because although SSRIs are safe, but they are not very potent because they recruit only one substance, which is serotonin. So the, so the, the, the science started to move forward into thinking of recruiting another monoamine, uh, norepinephrine and the serotonin. And that started the movement that's called serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. And the, the one that came first, the effects of Venlafax, <coughs> sorry, Venlafax and XR. Venlafax and XR is an excellent SNRI. What did this group bring to us? Number, it, it brings to us a lot of control over anxiety and depression. This group works so well when you have mixed anxiety and depression. As somebody who's depressed with a lot of anxiety, people with depression and post-traumatic, this group works very well. The active metabolite of venlafaxin, this venlafaxin, also called Prestique. Prestique had more norepinephrine than Effexor. So Effexor was... 30 serotonin to one epinephrine. You need to move 30, um, you, you need to excite 30 to, to excite only one norepinephrine. What does that mean? That means you need to go with a high dose like 225 or 300 milligram before it works as an actual SNRI. But the beauty of Pristique is that Pristique has more norepinephrine to serotonin. It has 10 to one. This is one of the, re so also because Pristique is the active metabolite, it is liver friendly. So if you have somebody with some liver impairment of, or increased liver enzyme, and you want to give an SRI, probably go this one. This one also is good into uh, treating in a way the um, vasomotor symptoms of perimenopause. It is off label though, but it is, uh, an off-label indication that is recognized in the uh, scientific um, uh, strat. Next to Prestique came Dioloxtine. Same 10 to 1, but Dioloxtine because it, it, it works on the gating theory of uh, the spinothalamic cord uh, into blocking the pain receptors, especially the not the normal nociceptor pain, but the neuropathic pain, it eventually got approved for diabetic neuropathic pain. Uh, Simpalta now is used in combination with other medications uh, to treat chronic pain. It's a good medication. This one, I'm not sure if it is present in the Middle East or not. Probably yes. So this came to Canada about two years ago called Levomelnacebran, called Fitzema. Menlacebram is not present in North America, uh, but it is present in Europe. The levomelnacebram, which uh, uh, called also Fitzema, this one, look to here, it has 
two norepinephrine to each serotonin. And that is why it is off label indicated for fibromyalgia. I am telling you now that I'm confident that this eventually will be approved for fibromyalgia, a beautiful medication for pain syndromes as well, uh, when, when they are accompanied with, with depression. This movement, so this medication use vasomotor symptoms, use fibromyalgia, and neuropathic pain, chronic pain syndrome. Definitely, these are antidepressants you can use in regular depression or uh, depression with anxiety for sure. During the, uh, the, 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 the search for a medication to reduce uh, nicotine craving, uh, to help with smoking cessation, this uh, antidepressant called papropion was discovered. Papropion was aiming to uh, reuptake dopamine norepinephrine, and by doing this, increasing the uh, time before people crash and have the craving for another smoke. I don't know if, uh, I mean, the, some of the audience who are my, my age were remembered in the old days when people need to take a smoke break every 15 minutes because they really are in craving. And it was socially accepted then to do so. Papropion was aiming in to get this up so the craving prolonged for about half an hour, an hour, um, or two hours, and that hopefully will uh, reduce the craving. But while the research was gone, the antidepressive property was discovered, a beautiful medication. But remember that you are manipulating dopamine here, meaning if somebody has anxiety, this is not the medication to give because you are increasing the, the, the anxiety. But you may, just, but you may um, think of papropion, uh, which is well butyrine for depression, called Zyban for smoking cessation. The difference is simple. Papropion is immediate release, whereas the papropion XL or SR, that's the well butyrine that we cause for depression. What do we do? In DRR, norepinephrine, DR, uh, norepinephrine dopamine reuptake, where are the other medications that work on dopamine and norepinephrine? These are the stimulants that we use for ADHD. Because of this, Wellbutrin is off-label indicated uh, for treating ADHD, and it's actually second uh, line in certain schools. According to the North American guidelines, it is off-label. But if you have a patient who is uh, addicted on cocaine, they have ADHD, probably Wellbutrin will be your medication. You may combine Wellbutrin as an antidepressant for somebody who have problems with attention and they are depressed. You use it for smoking cessation. Because it has the dopaminergic part, you can use it in this seasonal affective disorder. Works beautifully well. It also works well because it gives the morning allergy, sorry, not the allergy, sorry, the morning energy to your patients. You give it when you have this kind of depression where people have low energy, low sex drive, low motivation, um, sleep a lot, eat a lot. That, this is the type of depression that you consider well butyrin. Definitely post-addiction depression. The post-addiction depression is, um, in theory, caused because of depletion of the dopaminergic uh, mesolimbic uh, system during the period of chronic and protracted depression. And giving Wellbutrin um, during that time uh, is going to help the patients, no doubt. I also use it when people have depression and something uh, and, and de uh, dopamine depletion syndromes like Parkinson's, for instance. Then you can use it. The other class that is a, 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 that has only one medication is mirtazapine also called the Remeron. But remember that mirtazapine, NASA, this is norepinephrine and serotonin specific antidepressant. This is not serotonin reuptake though, this is serotonin specific. What does that mean? It means that mirtazapine is gonna increase the secretion uh, in the cells of serotonin by a direct way, not through reuptake. It will increase also the norepinephrine component through a direct, not through a reuptake mechanism. And it has three main specific blocking properties 
<clears throat> to block three of the major side effects of serotonin that usually cause people to stop the SSRIs. And these are sexual dysfunction, disruption to the sleep, and appetite problems. And no wonder that mirtazapine causes normalization of sleep architecture, causes increased appetite, and if people are not wise choosing their food, they will have weight gain. And mirtazapine is one of these antidepressants that has no sexual dysfunction. It actually may improve it. The other one that also has no sexual dysfunction but actually can improve it is the Wellbutrin as well. So Wellbutrin is your antidepressant to augment for somebody that for whatever reason you give SSRI, Sopralex or something and they come uh, with sexual dysfunction but they don't have anxiety. Where do you focus into giving mirtazapine? When the mainstream of the depressive patient is... Uh, uh, d d problems with sleep, improved sleep architecture. It is not through a sedative part, although it is a little bit sedative because it has a little bit of a histaminergic component, but that will go in a week or 10 days. It is usually due to improvement of the sleep architecture. And that is why sleep specialists love it. Uh, that is why uh, also we give it to the older depressed patients, or depressed patients in older age, who do not eat and do not sleep. And that is why geriatricians love mirtazapine as well. Improve appetite, uh, build healthy weight. You need that in the older gener in the older depressed people. If you wanna avoid sexual side effects, if you wanna avoid nausea and vomiting. But remember, it causes weight gain if people don't know how to, uh, uh, how to choose the right food. It causes nighttime, um, appetite, which can be problematic uh, as well. You may ask me, can I augment, like, can I give a little bit of mirtazapine, like a small dose, uh, not to treat depression, but to improve sleep uh, as an augmentation with an antidepressant? Yes, I do that all the time. A new group called multimodal. So multimodal is a group of new medication that doesn't cause um, uh, a, a improvement of the a chemical imbalance through either reuptake inhibition or direct stimulation. No, it modulates. What does modulation mean? Modulation means it, it, it reuptakes in certain areas and it stimulates directly in, in certain areas. And this is so beautiful because number one, they will act rapidly. So you don't need necessarily for the two weeks wait until symptoms uh, improve, their effect on uh, sexual dysfunctions are way minimal. They don't cause a lot of weight gain. The two examples we have, Vortioxtein, Trentilex. This medication is here in Canada now, and we are giving it a great medication. It's a serotonin modulator and stimulator. The other one, it's not here in Canada yet, maybe in the Middle East now, but it is approved by the FDA it's in the United States, Velazodone. Please uh, don't think that this is related to trazodone. It is, it is not related to trazodone. It's a serotonin modulate. Where, when do we use um, um, uh, antidepressant modulators? When are these modulators going to be beautiful? When there is cognitive symptoms associated with depression. The um, most up-to-date Canadian guidelines to treat depression recommended the use of this medication. Uh, when you deal with depression that has major cognitive problems. And the uh, best example for this is the uh, older age depressive episodes. And it, it's hard to tease uh, the depressive episodes due to depression versus the, 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 uh, the sorry, the uh, cognitive problems due to depression versus the cognitive problems that are part of the uh, aging. Uh, so that is why we use it in geriatric depression quite a bit. Moving to the uh, learning objectives. So um, depression is a diverse medical disorder. Depression can be due to chemical imbalance. Depression can be due to uh, environmental stress reactive depression that we call an adjustment disorder that causes um, uh, problems with adjusting to life. 
It can be due to medical problems. It can be due to substances. Substances means substances of abuse and also means medications. So these are diverse and we need to tease them from each other. Depression is more often caused by a medical condition and substance than a chemical imbalance. That is according to a recent statistics. Um, there is a need to get out the adjustment disorder at the beginning and get out the bereavement at the beginning because we will not treat them with antidepressants because they were not caused by a chemical imbalance for which you need to throw chemicals to treat. They will be treated by psychotherapy and sometimes with uh, cognitive behavior therapy. The choice of antidepressant is science, but it also has art. So you tailor the antidepressant to the patient. So if, if, if you have a patient, for instance, whose job is like a model or an artist, then probably weight gain would be the worst uh, side effect that you give to that patient. So before you choose an antidepressant, you probably want to avoid any antidepressant that can cause weight gain. If somebody is depressed, for instance, and, and, and still a, a young guy uh, in the beginning of his, of, then you probably want to avoid sexual dysfunction. If somebody has like irritable bowel syndrome and or inflammatory bowel syndrome, and you probably want to avoid antidepressants that can cause disruption of the gastrointestinal tract. So it's tailoring. And when I say tailoring, I don't mean um, tailoring the efficacy because believe me, they are all effective. The skill is to choose the antidepressant that will not cause the side effects that will cause this patient to stop the medication because these side effects are not tolerable to the patient. Now, uh, one of the common pitfalls is the patient comes after a few days, doctor, medication didn't work. Okay, cool, no worries. Stop it, give another one. Please wait. The medication is not working initially. After a few days, please wait and wait and wait. Why do I need, uh, sorry, why do I uh, use rating skills? I use rating skills to show to the patient that they are improving. So in the first visit, they rate themselves. In the second visit, they rate that they slept two hours uh, better. Um, uh, their energy is a little bit better. And the patients say, I'm not improving. Doctor, your medication is not working. Please uh, stop your medication. Please give me another medication. Then I say, wait, okay, you know what? Let us look to the evidence. And I show them how they rated themselves better. And through this day, I will be able to convince them to wait. Wait until the medication works. Uh, most patients, when they see the evidence, they agree with you. Understanding the augmentation versus combination. We can augment. Augmentation is an R. Putting a well-butrin, which is dopamine, norepinephrine, on a serotonergic agent is good because you are now recruiting three monoamines to work together. But giving a patient two SSRIs, this is not augmentation. This is combination of two similar medications. This is not good practice. This is part of polypharmacy, for instance. And polypharmacy uh, is not advisable at all in, 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 in a medical setting. Uh, polypharmacy will increase the side effects of the patient and polypharmacy is not needed. So instead of polypharmacy, we can increase the dose. So why give Sopralex 10 milligram and Prozac 20 milligram? Why not increase the dose of one of them and achieve, achieve uh, the same result without adding another medication uh, that will add a new set of antidepressant uh, of uh, a new set of side effects thank you very much and now we are open for questions <laughs>